All right, so now I'm going to go through um, just, uh, let's see, probably one, two, three, four examples um, out of section 6.5, which is where we're going to do some word problems um, in using our trig functions. So the first example that I want to do is I want us essentially to solve for the unknown side and angles of this right triangle. So notice we've got this 90 degree angle here. We're looking for our hypotenuse. We have the length of each of the legs and we wanna find each of the angles. Now there's a fair amount um, that we can do in multiple ways. Um, so as long as you're using the correct trig function, all should be well. Um, so for example, to find my side C, um, you know, first I could um, find one of my angles and then um, use a trig function to do that. But I just like going back to the Pythagorean theorem, honestly. So to find the length of my hypotenuse, I'm going to say that the length of one leg squared plus the length of the other leg squared is equal to the length of my hypotenuse squared. So that gives me 64 plus 25 is equal to C squared. 89 is C squared. So I'm gonna say that the length of my hypotenuse is the square root of 89. All right, so uh, no trig needed there. Now, what I'm gonna do is uh, find both my angles A and B. So again, it doesn't matter what trig function you use. Um, I'm gonna say, well, what trig function, for example, um, relates with this angle and these two sides. And I would say that my tangent of A is opposite over adjacent. Again, we could have used our sine, our cosine, or our tangent. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, you just got to pick one. All right, so how do we find the angle? Well, we want to undo our tangent function. So we take the inverse tangent of both sides. These two functions undo each other. And so my angle A is going to be the inverse tangent of 8 fifths. So one thing that you want to make sure you do is if you're going to do this computation in degree mode, make sure that whatever technology you're using, you have it in degree mode. And then I'll just press inverse tangent, eight fifths, and I get my angle A to be 57.9946 degrees. Now, from here, we could do one of two things. We could also use an inverse trig function to get our angle B. Um, you know, again, we could use our sine, inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent. Another thing that we can say is that we know that angle A and angle B um, have to add up to 90 degrees. So what I would do is just take 90 minus whatever this angle we found is to get our other angle B. Okay, I use the fact that I know that the sum of the angles in a triangle are um, 180 degrees. Therefore, these two must be complementary. Uh, again, if you want to uh, play with inverse trig functions, you can verify that you're going to get the exact same measure for that angle. All right, so that is one example um, that you're going similar to what you're going to need to be able to do in your um, homework. Now, what I want us to do next is actually um, question number five from the book. And um, again, what I'll do is I will put my paper right next to it. I'm gonna take notes and uh, then we'll <laughs> work it out, okay? So what this um, problem five asks us to do is find a possible formula for the trig function whose values are in this table, okay? 
I know this seems funky, but my plan here is to guide you through the thought process. Okay. So whenever we think about how, uh, what our trig function is going to be, we need to think about our amplitude. We need to think about our period. We need to think about uh, any sort of horizontal shift as well as the midline, AKA vertical shift. So the first thing that I'm gonna note here is what my period is. Okay, if I look at my inputs versus my outputs, notice I go from negative two, four, 10 and see how it goes again and repeats itself. So essentially one period is how long it takes me to go from this negative two here to this negative two here, because that's when it starts to repeat itself. And I see that I have a period of four, okay? Uh, the other, and again, I'll work all this out in detail in a moment. I just wanna get the relevant information from here. Um, the other thing that we can talk about is what is our midline? Well, how do you find your midline? Well, it's halfway between the largest and the smallest values. So notice my largest output is 10. My smallest output is negative two. So in order to find your midline, you take 10 plus a negative two, and then we divide that by two. So in this case, my midline is going to be four. And finally, our amplitude, that's the difference between the largest and smallest. And I should say then take half. So the amplitude is half the distance between the largest and the smallest value. Okay, so largest and smallest value. We want to find half that distance. So we're going to get an amplitude of six. All righty. So uh, last but not least, um, we see that when x is equal to zero, y is equal to negative two, we're going to have to use that value to gauge some sort of shift. Okay. So let's get this moving here. Uh, we have our midline. We know we're going to be adding four at the end, but let's first deal with our period. We know that our period is two pi over K. Again, we can solve this for K. I get four K is two pi. So K is two pi over four or pi over two. All right. So we also have our amplitude. So thus far, I'm going to say y is equal to six. And I'm gonna use a sine wave for this. If you used a cosine wave, um, whatever your shift would be will come out when we plug in an ordered pair, okay? So at this point, there I have pi over two, x minus k plus four, okay? And again, at this point, you could have it be a cosine, um, but that'll just affect um, what your phase shift or your horizontal shift is, and that will come clear when we plug in an ordered pair. I tend to use my sign uh, for these sorts of problems. All right, so how do we find our value of K? Well, we have an ordered pair from our table, so we can plug that in. If I plug in zero, negative two, uh, what do I get? I get my Y value is negative two, six times the sine of pi over two, zero minus K plus four. And so that gives me negative two is six sine pi over two times negative K plus four. And now what we need to do is we need to find out what this K is. So how would we solve for this? This goes back to our trig equations. You wanna isolate your trig function. 
So the first thing we're going to do is move this plus four over. So we'll subtract that from both sides. And from there, I'm going to get, well, negative six is equal to six times the sine of pi over two, two times negative k. All right, now we can divide by six. To isolate our trig function, we get negative one is sine pi over two of negative k. And now I'm going to use the fact that my sine is an odd function, okay? Recall that the sine of negative theta is negative sine of theta. So the sine of pi over two times negative k, it just means that we can bring the negative out here. In other words, we're solving one is equal to sine of pi over two k. So um, we can go in the nitty gritty details now of uh, solving our uh, trig equations like we did in the last section. What I'm going to do is use my mode of substitution. I'm going to say, I'm going to let u be pi over 2k. So essentially, right now, what I'm wanting to find is where is the sine of u equal to 1? Well, I know there that the sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1. So we get u is equal to pi over 2 times k which gives me k equals one. Therefore, the equation is six sine pi over two, x minus one plus four. Okay, a lot went on in there. Notice I used my period to gauge and find this value that goes out in front. And I did that just by looking at the table. My midline is halfway between the largest and the smallest value. My amplitude is half the difference between the largest and the smallest value. And then what I did is I took an ordered pair and plugged it in to determine what my horizontal shift was. All righty. So the next example that I'm going to do and I'm intentionally picking examples similar to what you need to do in your homework in order to help you prepare for these, okay? So let's look at number seven here. What we're given is that, and I'm gonna take notes over here and um, then we'll, we'll get to work. So what it says is outside temperature over the course of a day can be modeled using um, a sinusoidal function, in other words, sine or cosine, okay? So suppose we know the high is 63 and the low is 37, and that occurs at 5 a.m., okay? We assume that T is the number of hours since midnight, and we want to find an equation for the temperature D in terms of T. All right, so I took notes. Notice that one thing we're going to have to extract from here is not stated explicitly. Because we're talking about the days and we're talking about the number of hours in a day, one other thing that I want to add is that my period is 24 hours, okay? So I've taken notes from everything that we have here. And so now what we'll do is we're going to work it. Now with this first one, I'll show you kind of what a graph is going to look like, um, but I will also make a comment that you can kind of um use this idea for, for your examples as well. Okay, so what do we have? Well, let's start. Our period is 24, which is two pi over K. 
So we can find our value of k here. We get 24k is 2 pi. So k is going to be pi over 12. Okay. So we got that k value. Notice this is our previous example, but we got somewhere here. All righty. So what other information do we have? Well, we can find, um, we know that our high occurs at 63 and the low occurs at 5 a.m. Well, if T represents the number of hours since midnight, what I'm gonna say then is when T is equal to five, my temperature D, right? We want D of T is 37. Okay, so we know that that lies on the graph. And we can also say, well, since um, my period is 24 hours, 24 hours later, in other words, 29 is also going to go through 37. Okay, this is just using the idea that it's a periodic function. Okay. All righty. Now, the other thing that we're, we know is that because this is following a sinusoidal function, um, the high is going to be 12 hours after the low. So if I know that my low occurs five hours after midnight, I know that my low, or excuse me, if I know that my low occurs five hours after midnight, I know that my high is going to occur 12 hours after that. So we also know that the ordered pair 1763 lives on our graph, right? 12 plus five gives me that 17. Okay, so other things just to model from our previous example, we wanna find our midline and we wanna find our amplitude, okay? So recall that your midline is halfway uh, between your largest and your smallest value. So I take 63 plus 37 divided by two. So I know that my midline is at 50. Okay, that's the middle of my function. I know that my amplitude is half the difference between the high and the low. So I take 63 minus 37 and divide that by two, and I'm going to get 13, okay? So we've gotten a lot of information. Um, the thing is, what is this gonna look like? I mean, we could use a sine graph or a cosine graph, but what I'm gonna do um, in this particular example is let's graph this so far. I really like getting visuals. And as always, I'm going to tell you that my graph is not drawn to scale. So here is 537. 12 hours later, I'm at 1763. And then 12 hours after that, I'm at 2937. Notice this is our low. So this is what it looks like. And we'll just say that y equals 50 is our midline. All right. Now, to me, this looks like a cosine graph, but reflected. It's upside down, OK? Right, because with our cosine graph, we go decrease then increase. Notice this is just flipped about that, okay? What does reflected tell us? Well, it tells us that we're going to have a negative in front of our amplitude, okay? So at this point, I'm going to say that y is negative 13. Notice it's reflected, so that's where the negative comes from. Cosine, we have got our period, so we got our value of k, or one value of k. Um, doesn't really matter what we call this, okay? Now, one thing that I can say is 
note, this is shifted five to the right, okay? So I know already what value is going to be um, in here since it shifted five uh, to the right, okay? Normally you would be here on your um, vertical axis. Another thing you can do if you want is plug in an ordered pair and solve it that way. But I'm just going to note this is shifted right five. Okay, that's where that min occurred. So I claim that's the equation of my function. Pretty funky, huh? All right, let's do one more example just to be sure that we have this down. It's going to be a very similar example. And what I'm going to say is let's suppose that the outside temperature high is 74, the low is 64, we'll do it 5 a.m. And T is the number of hours past midnight. And once again, we want to model this function, okay? We could do a graph, absolutely. Um, and you'll see that it's going to be another reflected um, cosine, okay? Again, this is day by day, so my period is 24 hours, and we already found that that corresponds to a value of pi over 12. There's no sense in redoing this. Midline, again, is halfway between the largest and the smallest value. So I take 74 plus 64 divided by two. And so my midline is at the line y equals 69. My amplitude is half the difference between the largest and the smallest values. So my amplitude is five. So we got it, okay? Again, we know that this is a reflected cosine graph. So we have negative five cosine pi over 12. And again, this is shifted since my low occurs five hours after midnight, that's gonna be X minus five. If my low occurred at 3 a.m., you'd have X minus three. And then plus 69. So this is just a little taste of uh, some of the really cool things that we can model thus far with our trig functions. All right, um, I urge you to read through um, the examples provided in the book as well in order to help give you more practice and intuition. They do a really awesome job of explaining um, each step. All right, have fun.